And tonight I am going to read to you a story called The Tick of the Engine. And um, we don't have very many on here. Maybe people are busy tonight and won't be on. But anyway, I'm just going to jump into it. Um, the story that I'm going to read tonight has an interesting story. <laughs> There's a story behind the story. So The Tick of the Engine, for anybody who's... Well, maybe even if you are from Newfoundland, but if you're not, it's the make and break engine, the old um, engines that fishermen first had in their wooden boats back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and so on. Those boats had a very uh, specific sound. They made a put, 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 put sound. Um, there's still a few of them around. I know on Change Islands, there's a few people who have those boats with their engines. And the sound that they made, they called it the tick. The engine made a certain sound. And they were all different, uh, even though they were similar engines. They all had sort of a different rhythm, a different tick of the engine. So uh, I was probably a teenager. And I remember, and I can picture now, my father uh, got up in the morning and he had his uh, cup of tea in his hand. He was looking out the window and I have my cup of tea. And he was saying that he'd had a dream, that he had dreamt that there was this, that he had written a story. And the story was about the tick of the engine. And he couldn't remember the story, but he just knew that it was all really well put together and had um, the center of it was this idea of the tick of the engine. And he explained to me what that was and how the women in the community knew the sound of their husband coming back from fishing by this very particular sound of their, they know, they knew their own um, husband's boat sound and they would know when things were, they were coming and they would just start getting dinner ready or whatever and, and they would listen for it. If they were concerned at all, they would listen for the tick of the engine. So he told me that when I was a teenager and uh, like teenagers do, <laughs> <laughs> probably left that evening, went down the road and hung out with my friends and forgot about it. I definitely forgot about it for years. And then I was living in Ontario, and I lived in a little place called Tavistock, Ontario. And I was out walking my dog one day, beautiful, uh, I lived in, it's a rural community, and I was walking past a golf course. And I was walking the dog, and I, I guess I was just thinking, uh, you know, you're in your own mind when you're walking. And it, I remembered it. I remembered him telling me about the tick of the engine and the story that he had dreamt in his mind, which I didn't know what that story was. He didn't either. And so I turned around immediately and went back home and started just drafting something um, to have an idea of um, a story centered around the idea of the tick of the engine. So I wrote this story and it was actually one of the first stories that I wrote that was sort of historical fiction about Newfoundland and uh, um, the women who uh, waited at home and the men who went to sea and I guess it kind of uh, um, started my journey into historical fiction. Uh, it's, oh, I don't know, 15 years old maybe? Uh, between 10 and 15 years old since I've written this story. And uh, so I thought that would be a good one to read it read to you. Uh, and I'm going to jump right into it. I'm not sure how long it, I read it over. I did not time it, but I think it'll fit within our time frame. So I'll just start with the tick of the engine. A mist lay over the land, a still shroud that would burn away with the heat of the sun. Jean considered the day. It was not foggy, not clear, and too early to say what the weather would be. The tick of the engine faded, and a shiver went down her spine. She walked the well-worn path back to the house in the sem semi-light early morning hours. Jean always woke when Tom woke, and made sure his lunch was in the shabby blue grub box that had been his father's and his father's father's in times past, and it was she who carried it for him to the stage head every morning. She also always cooked him a hot breakfast and made him strong tea, as was her duty. She loved her Tom in the deep, quiet way of the times, and brushed away acknowledgment, the admission of a weakness of her heart with a briskness, briskness that belied the depths of her feelings. Tom was a rare man who saw her, 
who saw her care as a favor, not as a requirement, and her duties were easier for his goodness. Weariness washed over her, and she sighed. The babies were coming regularly, as was to be expected, but they drained the energy from her body more each time. Only her fierce determination to continue as though nothing was amiss, as though she were as hardy as Tom thought, got her through. For Jean, weakness could not be borne. Determined, she carried on with grit. Tom had married a strong, hardy girl, and she'd never allow weakness or frailty to show, though sometimes she slipped off to their bedroom to nap while he was gone on the water. She licked her lips as the wind picked up, and the taste of salt on them told her the wind direction. The tick of the engine faded, and the pit of her stomach ached for a brief moment, as it always did when it silenced. She picked up her pace as the chill broke through her coat. She shivered again. It wasn't so cold, though, that she didn't stop and walk around the bridge that spanned the back of the house to look out over the water for further signs of what the day would bring. The shadows of the cliffs and rocks were ghostly in the distance. The water roared like an angry animal, disgruntled at being slowed by the cliffs it bashed against. A dull ache in her left hip said storm, and she gasped when she felt it. The fatigue from the pregnancy had made her head fuzzy and her senses dull. She had an uncanny way of knowing when, the storm when a storm brewed, but she'd not had any signs before he left and hadn't known to warn Tom. She shook her head, nipping the sense of foreboding that suddenly came upon her in the bud. She turned quickly to go around the house to the front door before she could give it further license. She entered the house to silence. This early in the morning there was not yet another up. The baby slept between her sisters now where she slept the longest and warmest. Annie was six and Mary was four. The baby, Rachel, was almost two and the younger girls were her constant caretakers. Her mother was too busy with the work of the days to care for babies beyond nursing them while they still needed her milk. But Rachel was now weaned, and Annie and Mary loved and doted on their little sister. Bigger sisters, each in their turn, became caretaker of the new babies, adopting them as their own. It was the way it was in big families. Boys were different, of course. Boys er learned outdoor work, not baby care. But there were no boys yet to share Tom's load. Maybe this time, she hoped. The older girls, Bessie and Margaret, were able to work around the house now at ten and twelve. And at twelve, the eldest Margaret was proving to be quite a hard worker, a pride to her mother as much as a role model for her younger sister, sister Bessie, who struggled to keep up and was sickly and weaker and needed a bit more time and frequent rest, though she tried hard to learn the skills to keep a good house. Her mother was harsh sometimes, with no patience for sickness and weakness, and her older sister often did more to compensate for her closest for the closest girl or the younger girl if the work was done mostly mother was satisfied though everyone knew margaret carried the load jean rarely let her mind slip to the lost ones the two babies that had become between annie and bessie their only their only boy too small to live who hadn't breathed at all and his sister who had lived for a day but also passed too soon to really have made any mark on the world James and Patience, the boy not named after his father, they'd save that name for a living boy, and Patience, a name too frivolous to have been, ever been bestowed upon a living daughter, was given to the little girl who would be the only one in the family with a pretty name over a practical one. They were each quietly and solemnly baptized in her bedroom and were bur buried next to each other in the church cemetery, unmarked until one of their parents passed and a marker would be shared with them. She wept for each the day of their deaths, and then that was it. Tom looked at her with confusion each time a child was lost, his blue eyes holding a sad searching as though he didn't quite know what to do about her or them, and she'd stiffened her spine each time and bore up stoically for his benefit. She must be strong for Tom, like the pitcher plants on the marsh that survived anything the cold North Atlantic winters tossed at them. It was what he liked best about her. The work of the morning was a blessing, for it kept her mind and her eyes off the blackening skies in the distance that colored the cold waters of the ocean in the dark hue of morning. She knew Tom would be late. His was always the last boat in. He fished alone, 
having no brother. He'd always done so, though she knew he'd meet this man or that man on the grounds where he'd go. It had been clear enough to make out the marks this morning, or he wouldn't have gone, but now the sky was threatening and dangerous. She went quickly to bring in the small line of clothes she'd strung up in defiance earlier in the day. Her ears prickled at the sound of the tick of an engine, only to be disappointed yet again. Not Tom. The silence between the ticks longer than that of Tom's engine, and it was that silence between the ticks of the motor that she knew so well. A little miss, a hesitation that distinguished it from Mickey Hammond's boat or the Murphy's boys, Murphy boy's skiff. She watched the sky with quiet anxiety, knowing there were no fish to be had. <laughs> knowing were there fish to be had, Tom wouldn't leave the ground for home. She felt proud and frustrated all at once. The wind picked up, and she felt the first peck of the rain that pecks of the rain as she dragged the last sheet off the line with a yank and pulled herself towards the house, ignoring the increasing twinge of pain in her hip. She might have just wrenched it somewhere, and she couldn't remember. It m meant nothing as it meant nothing. She thought as she denied every clue that a bad storm was brewing. Her heart refused to believe what her eyes told her because ability to get through each moment demanded it. The girls were about their work, bread laid out on the counter, rising potatoes and cabbage for dinner in the bowl waiting, salt beef, turnip, carrots boiling in the pot, the, the co clock ticking off the minutes under Margaret's watchful eye, waiting for the exact moment when potatoes and cabbage would join them. Her stomach rolled at the smell of the aroma of Tom's favorite meal. She went to the pantry and pulled out the boiled raisin cake she'd made the day before. It was to be for Sunday, but she thought Tom might want it today. She put the butter out, too. He liked butter on his cake. The table was set, and minutes slipped away, one into the other, until the dinner was cooked. The wickedness of the wind could no longer be ignored, and Bessie commented on it, wondering out loud if her father was safe to be out there. Jean snapped harshly at her to get her lazy body to work in a sharp tone, and to stop being so foolish over a bit of wind and rain as she rubbed a hand over the ever-increasing pain in her hip. It was a bad one. The sea would swell and the wind would dance a deadly two-step. It would come seemingly out of nowhere in the harsh North Atlantic, as these storms did, harbingers of death and destruction, and more than one vulnerable little skiff had fallen to their sudden, swift, and malicious fury. While the ocean offered up a valuable gift, sometimes it demanded a bounty, and that bounty was a price too high to pay. Yet again she shook it off, and her ears, ears strained to hear over the increasing volume of the wind outside. She felt a dread in the pit of her stomach, a deep and desperate dread. Despair so sudden, so unexpected, it almost took the breath from her bosom. She caught her breath loudly and walked swiftly to the door, grabbing her coat as she went. She held it tight about her, the wind pulling and whipping her around her face. The ocean, angry and desperate, seemed to tr be trying its best to knock the granite off the rock faces. She looked out at the angry water, her wrinkled brow, her sharp gray eyes, searching for any sign that he was on his way in. Her anger matched the winds. Her worry was as deep as the ocean. Her desperation knew no analogy. She looked along the horizon, scanning north to south, an endless, infinite stretch of black water, white only where it hammered against the di distant islands and rocks. She fell to her knees in the sheltered corner of the house and prayed to her God in desperation that he bring Tom. I'm not sure if you're, if the feed is very good. Uh, just got a little message. But anyway, I'll keep reading. She knew, though she wouldn't consciously admit it, that she'd be angered beyond sanity at God if Tom didn't come home today. She hoped he wouldn't hold it against her for she'd be even angrier at herself. The wind gusted and whirled, its strength bringing the tears to her eyes that would come to her in fear. She wiped them away and stood up. She thought maybe the storm was calming, and anyway, dinner was done. She walked back into the house, drunkenly in the path of the wind, and qu quickly set the girls to setting f some food for themselves. She wouldn't show them her weakness, her worry. Tom wouldn't like that. She ate with them. She filled herself on the boiled dinner and chewed absently on the salt, tasty salt beef that normally she ate with gusto. Her brain cursed her for letting her heart get, get to her. Weak, she berated herself. She was weak for worrying. 
She knew for sure the wind was dropping now, and she had already heard the tick of Mickey Hammond's motor, so different from Tom's that she hadn't even had that momentarily, momentary quickening of her pulse that it might be him. She rocked the baby to sleep after dinner, a rare, rare treat for little Rachel, who looked up at her mother with large gray eyes that matched her own, and a soft smile at, his unexpected at, at this unexpected attention. She loved her sisters, but sometimes she wanted her mother. She fell asleep quickly in the quiet solace of her mother's arms, and Jean rocked her far longer than was needed until, with a sigh, she carried her to the bed. She dawdled long enough. With a glance at the uneaten leftover food on the stove warmer, she went outside with the basket of still damp sheets she'd pulled in quickly earlier on. She started to hang them back on the line with a defeated air when she heard it in the distance. So quietly. She barely dared hope that she'd heard correctly, silently censoring herself for being so faint-hearted. But it grew louder until there was no denying it. That space, that mist, that little hesitation between the ticks, as distinct as a fingerprint is on a man. Each motor of each boat had its own tick, and she knew his as well as any Newfoundland wife knew their own. That space, that mist, that little hesitation that identified her Tom's boat from Mickey Hammond's or from the Murphy's boat. Her heart beat gentler in her breast, and the baby in her belly moved with a soft roll inside of her, as if to adjust itself to the new rhythm it now slept, slept next to. It was then that she remembered to breathe again. She slowly hung the rest of the sheets on the line, and then stopped by and called to Margaret to make a place for her father at the table while she went to meet Tom at the wharf, as she always did. She adjusted her face into its normal, serious expression, tamping down the grin of happiness that lurked just beneath the surface. He brought the boat in closer, and she saw as they approached each other, him on the water still, her on the land, that there, there was a hefty haul of fish in the boat, and while she wasn't sunk to the gunwale, she was well down in the water. A good day's pay. She grabbed the rope he tossed her and tied the little skiff on with the painter as deftly as any man. Anything on the go, missus? Tom asked her with a grin. That bugger, he'd had fun out there. Not much, she said briskly, irritated. Dinner's on, and she stepped back as he climbed onto the wharf and took off his soaked rubber clothes and hung them on a nail on the edge of on the side of the stage. Then they walked up to the house in companionable silence, her heart beating again in the rhythm it was meant to, with a space, a miss, a little hesitation. A rhythm made by God to match the tick of the engine.